Uh, thank you everyone who's not eating lunch for coming. Uh, uh, so the title of the panel is uh, Security of Small States. My name is Ivan Kovac and I'll be uh, chairing uh, the panel and providing some comments at the end. We have two great speakers, my friends, uh, Sam and Mark. Um, Samuel Green is a professor at Sheffield University, uh, focusing on insurgency, counterinsurgency, and uh, Mark Hamilton is a professor at Inter-American Defense College, uh, and uh, his research focuses on uh, multidimensional security uh, questions. Uh, and both of them will present exciting uh, papers, and I will provide some comments, and then we will go as soon as possible to the questions and uh, comments from the uh, so many audience that we have. So please, uh, uh, Sam, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you. And, and now I have no pressure, right? Uh, great, very interesting, engaging. Shukran Azizi. Thank you, friend. All right. So a brief outline of what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to start by framing what do we mean when we talk about homeland security? What is the U.S. homeland security construct? And how is it taught in the U.S.? And then I'm going to transition to the region. Uh, I'm going to use a case study of the United Arab Emirates. So I'm going to look at what are the Emirates' domestic security priorities, why the U.S. homeland security construct gets applied to small states like the Emirates, why it's not really applicable, and some ideas uh, about how we can do better. Right. So the first question and the first problem is what do we mean by homeland security anyway? which is a vexing problem, right? The Congressional Research Service did an extensive study and their conclusion was the government has lots of different definitions. We don't, we, we can't decide. So what is it? Is it counterterrorism, right? Which the Obama, not the Trump, but the Obama national security strategy says is the core responsibility. Is it what we can call all hazards, which, or terrorism plus natural disasters, emergency response, recovery? Is it whatever the Department of Homeland Security does, uh, which is in fact one way, although perhaps a particularly problematic way of thinking of it. Is it something else? Is it perhaps infringing on civil liberties? And that's really how we should define Homeland Security. So a lot of different understandings of it running around. What I'm going to try to do is boil down to a couple core principles that I think are very common, and then we'll explain some of their limitations. Right, so this is something that this construct of home versus away that I think is particularly pervasive from the creation of Homeland Security by the Bush administration through the Obama administration to the Trump administration. And that's the idea that if we look at the threats that we're facing, there's things inside the country, the home game, that's Homeland Security. There's things outside the country, that's national security. Never the twain shall meet. And while at different points, all three of the administrations have said, well, we need to walk away from this a little bit, I'm very unconvinced that either, all three of the administrations have done that, right? So the idea is protecting the border, what gains entry, that's the home game. The away game is economic regulation, regulating the Iran nuclear deal, that's all outside the country, even if some of the fears for example, of Iran's nuclear program are really about how it might be utilized. So this is a common framework, not just in the policy world, but also in the teaching world. All right, the other thing, this, so this is Jeff Johnson, this is Secretary Nielsen, which I'm sure we've all seen in the news, uh, being increasingly annoyed at all the hard questions he's being asked for congressional testimony. Right. So there's a sense that the Obama administration, the Trump administration's priorities for domestic security are very different. And I'm going to respectfully challenge that. Certainly, the operationalization is very different. Right? The Obama administration did not want or seek lots of pictures of families being separated at the border. Right? But whose priorities are these? Prevent terrorism, enhance security, secure and manage our borders, enforce and administer our immigration, laws, safeguard and secure cyberspace, strengthen preparedness and resilience. Is this Trump or Obama? 
Hey, yeah, this is the Obama administration. Exact five guidelines in, in the every four year Homeland Security review. So the, the actual goals, I don't think are that different. Yes, the Trump administration has maybe put secure and manage our borders one, although there's certainly a lot of rhetoric on terrorism. Their practice is different, but the priorities are not that different. Right? And what's not on that list? Right? Anything that's not very clearly bounded inside the borders of the US. So it's a very American way of thinking about Homeland Security, a very protected by big oceans with a big friendly Canadian border way of thinking about things. And when we teach Homeland Security in the US, texts and programs tend to reflect this construct. And the second piece is that many programs and texts are explicitly built around the Department of Homeland Security. What are we going to study? What DHS says is important. You know, which I think is particularly problematic for an academic discipline which Homeland Security says it's becoming. Right, so just looking at the priorities, these are the Obama administrations, but I've argued they haven't changed that much, and what gets taught? Terrorism, law, crisis management, cybersecurity, intelligence. Not bad things. And this is from a review of uh, 27 Homeland Security programs that, that are on the DHS website. Um, some programs even explicitly say we're aligning this to what the US does. Right? But when we move this to a very different strategic concept, how relevant is it? And I'll first say that I'm skeptical about this concept as applied in the US. Right? But for the purposes of today, how useful is this construct applied in a very different context? Right? Just, uh, I think that map, right? it's about yeah, hour and 15 minutes to align faster if I don't care about uh, how much I have to pay in speeding tickets. The cameras are, are, are becoming more and more robust. You know, about an hour and a half to Dubai. Again, I can get there faster if I have enough wasps not to pay my speeding tickets, which I don't. Um, right, and look at this environment. Right, we have a big strategic adversary right here in Iran. We have the country rupture. Emirati Omani relations at times have been frosty. Emirati Saudi relations, although they're quite warm now, have at times been frosty. And the Gulf, and trying to be neutral here, the Gulf, um, is also important for things like drinking water. Right? So it's a complex strategic environment, and the away game can very fundamentally influence a lot of what happens at home. Right? A couple examples. Right, so if you go to the, the UAE and talk to anyone for any amount of time, they'll say, Iran stole our islands. Right, the, the three occupied islands are a very important strategic issue. So Iran, yes, it's a shared challenge. The US and the UAE are both concerned about it, but there's actual disputed territory. Right, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get closer to mixing the two games. Extremist ideology, right, this is a, an Emirati national uh, stabbed to death an expat, uh, the Reem Island ghost case, which uh, international attention, right? So it's a fear of extremist ideology influencing the country's own citizens. Water and food security, particularly water security, but also food. Uh, where does water come from? It's desalinated from the Gulf, all right? So it's home, but also perhaps away. Demographics, right? The labor balance of the, the UAE, about 90% expat laborers. That's at home, but for example, if there's problems between India and Pakistan outside the country, that's also very much an internal issue. And of course, energy security. Right, so if you map the priorities themselves, they might not be, with the exception of demographics and water, that different from the US priorities, but the influence that the away game has it is very, very visible. Right? I mean, and even if you look, five minutes, great. Right. Even if you look at Yemen, right, the, the controversial operation, so the UAE frames this in part in national security, right, Iran, but there's also a domestic element to this. It's much more prevalent than I think you would hear from, say, the US rhetoric about justifying going to Iraq. So why is this divergence so important? Right. 
The reason is that all over the Middle East, not just in the Emirates, you have American education springing up. And in terms of security, you have a lot of, quote, homeland security curriculums, often very American design in places as diverse as Israel, Saudi Arabia, Iran, or not Iran, excuse me. Uh, I don't think Iran is important in the U.S. security context. Uh, Israel, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, uh, <clears throat> to some extent Qatar, although it's a little different. Right, so as American education grows, we have the American construct. But I don't think it's applicable to that strategic context. Right, so in my previous job, I spent several years teaching homeland se security, among other things. Uh, we'll call it domestic security, in the Emirates. And the way the security was framed, it's a very American curriculum. We have international security in the international strategic context, and domestic security in the domestic strategic concept, construct. Never the twain shall meet, right? But this American way of thinking is really problematic for security thinkers in a small state. So just briefly, water security case study, all right? Is this domestic security or is it national security? All right. So maybe it's domestic, right? I mean, the, the Emirati use as much water as Americans do, which is incredible considering how expensive and scarce water is in the region, right? So maybe we get water security by domestic. How do we use it? All right, but think about the Gulf. All right. If an oil tanker leaks in the Gulf, is that domestic? International waters? No. That means the desalinization doesn't work. All right. If other countries and us together pump too much water and the Gulf becomes too saline, the process doesn't work. Is that domestic or is that regional? All right. uh, if Qatar doesn't want to sell LNG because of the dispute, which we use to fire our plants, is that domestic? Or is that national? Right. So I think a creative thinker will be able to look at both of those. So here are my two solutions. One is, if you're not in the US, for sure, you should incorporate domestic security concepts and perspectives from outside the US. Uh, the group Khalifa University that does, from my experience, the best job in the region, uh, recruited people from Britain, from Australia, uh, and I believe looked at Singapore and France, specifically so their curriculum wasn't focused only on great world power thinking about domestic security. But the second piece is maybe the most important. I think the model of separating the two, here's national and here's domestic, is fundamentally flawed, particularly in a small power. So I think both teaching but also as practitioners, thinking about security should be melded. And this is where I think we can avoid what I see as um, unrealistic or contorted thinking about domestic security. So I'm happy to Q&A to expand any of these points or talk more broadly about them. On time, perfect. Uh, and we'll... So we'll go through and then we'll take questions at the end. Right, right. And we'll go to Mark. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. All right. All right. So I'm going to be coming to this from a little, little different, a little different perspective. Um, Sam and I talked about this the other night. I'm actually, I will make no claims of being an expert on Middle Eastern politics. Um, my background is working in the Americas. Um, I have spent some time. Um, I have spent some time in the Middle East. Very interested. Dissertation committees, things like that. I have a shadow base of any. And so my research was kind of looking at youth globalization that I worked in the government and in South Asia, uh, and then playing out what would this look like in the Middle East. So there's a little bit of that. But looking at here, security discourse in the Middle East, what are some lessons from abroad? So what are some things that I think might be able to look at from other places? And I'm going to talk some about what are some of the lessons from the Americans particularly a concept called multidimensional security, uh, which is embraced by the Organization of American States, and it's a, it's a course that I teach within the context that I'm in. And I'll talk some about some of the critical tensions, elements, and lessons learned for the Americas, and then finally, what might that mean more generally, 
of what might have been to the middle east. So as we deal with uh, security as well as the Middle East, you have the national security homeland security that, that Sam was talking about. Um, and often depending on where we're coming from, whether this is a, a US curriculum or elsewhere, anti-terrorism, militarization, counterinsurgency issues, talking about oil, what can we get from other contexts is also an interesting question. And, and from the Americas, there's this idea of multidimensional security, which was framed by the Organization of American States. It's not particularly well understood in the beginning of the Americas um, when, you, when you go at the state level. Um, so what is it? What, what's the meaning? What are some of the, the concepts and, and contested concepts? And why does it matter? This was developed in 2003 um, in the Americas. So we're, we're more than 15 years out. And the question is, what has it been doing? Has it been working? Things like that. So multidimensional security is a mosaic in some way that I'm talking about. It blends the idea of national human <coughs> security issues of development. It's engaging citizen security, strong institutions. Um, a lot of different things are underneath this. And the idea with this is all of the countries in the Americas got together, and this is not surprising when after September 11th, here in the United States. Um, but you get all these countries come together, and they basically say, hey, security is more than just traditional national security. We need to think about this in a broader way. Um, and post-Cold War, and basically said it's expanded to encompass new, new and non-traditional threats, political, economic, social, health, and environmental aspects, and we need to coordinate basically, what this talking about. But it's almost a laundry list of everything you know, say in my classes right now. Um, basically, name anything security and throw it against the wall, and it's probably enough. Uh, because you have a different, like, what do they say, what say security is, what does Brazil say security is, what's Colombia, and basically get together all those and put them in a document that everyone can accept, politically. So what is, what's the strength, what are the weaknesses, what's the relevance? I think. Where I'm coming from, so I'm teaching, I'm teaching for senior, mid to senior level military, um, police, and diplomatic officers from their countries. Uh, from about 14 to 15 countries from the Americas, just on the street here in DC. Uh, so it's at Fort McNair, but it's not under the US government. It's under the Organization of the American States. So like my boss is next. Um, it's very strange. Uh, faculty is multinational, our student body multinational, and there's no document instruction. So the, the curriculum is created by the faculty engaging with what are the national priorities and the United States. So within this, it's a graduate program, Inter-American Defense and Security, we teach in four languages. So again, language, culture, all of this is coming to bed. It's a nightmare in order to try to develop um, by reading through the program. That's something. And I teach a class on multidimensional security in America. So our, my students are really interested in this concept, what we talk about. Most of them have never heard of it. Um, but there's a lot of skepticism, particularly for the military. Um, because as we go through, in the military, okay, what's our mission? And as soon as we start talking about security, we say, all these things are sure. I can't control it. I, I can't do What's the threat definition? What can I do? And then, yet they see a need. They're, and so they're like, why, if this is so important, why haven't we heard of it? And also, what are we supposed to do? Is, is the big issue. And, and one of the things, this, this home game, home and away game piece, is something that's really big in the Americas as well. Uh, within the Organization of the United States, the kind of intra American security system, there's the intra national debates and challenges, a lot of civil military issues, a lot of class based issues historically, and a lot of institutional challenges. And then the international challenges of caught between this idea of Regional accountability on the one hand, um, the OAS is speaking out a lot of what's happening in Venezuela, but on the other hand, it's guarding the national sovereignty. Uh, and so it's always caught in the middle of those issues. And then you have this national security framework, which is all about protecting the state. Uh, I would say in between you have the public security and the homeland security, which is about how do you defend the community. And then you get at the human security, which is how do you protect the individual. Um, and they're very different frameworks. And multidimensional security, in many ways, is trying to blend and deal with national, public, citizen, and human security all together, which has aspects of the away game that Sam was talking about, the external orientation, but has aspects of the internal orientation, and also the state focus versus the individual focus. So it's really caught in the middle of the kind of issues it's trying to address. And I kind of frame within a quadrant of it's looking at social and environmental vulnerabilities, poverty, inequality, 
Uh, it's looking at natural disasters, HIV, all kinds of just structural challenges that we see in our countries, climate change, that are all mentioned in this document. The other is transnational organized crime and public security, which is the number one priority within the Americas because of gang violence, uh, because of high levels just of violence, period, and insecurity in the streets. Um, asymmetric attacks, issues of terrorism, which the U.S. made sure was on the playing field, but other countries also embrace cybersecurity, weapons mass destruction, and then traditional security. So these are all issues. On the social and environmental quadrant, we kind of deal with this of a development approach, a humanitarian and securitized approach. And I think this very thing is some of the things that think about because these aren't talked about very much in homeland security. They're not. Uh, they're not talked about in military courses either. So we're dealing with, when we talk about development, are we focused on economic growth? Are we talking about kind of human capabilities and human, human development? Or are we looking at sustainability issues? We talk about inequality and marginalization. We run classroom exercises to think about how marginalization happens. Looking at gender, migration, race and ethnicity um, within all of these things. A humanitarian frame looks at how do we save lives? So it's looking at what's going on with natural disasters, migration flows, and a big focus with all of these are where are institutions at the state level? What are they able to handle? And then there's a securitized view of these vulnerabilities, which look at the reason we care about poverty, exclusion, disasters, is because it weakens the state and they might try to overthrow us. Right? These are all different orientations to it. And even something like the migrant caravan, which is all over the news here in the United States, it looks different if you look from a development lens versus a humanitarian lens versus a security lens. So this is just the vulnerabilities of structural risk. You know, if we go into the transnational organized crime, Corruption, money laundering, I mean, the amount of Latin American presidents who have gone to prison in recent years is amazing. Um, the debates that are around here, um, when you look at all of the polls, number one are not the issues. The number one issue is insecurity. I don't know if I can go outside because I don't know what's going to happen to me. Right? The vigilante violence, all these kind of things. Homicide rates, I mean, or where our human development is, where the violent rates are, are incredible. Um, as you play that out, I'm not going to put the map of the world up here. But looking at underdevelopment, rule of law, issues, there's a lot of challenges that are coming to bear. And again, one of the things we talk about in our classes are, what is, what's the quality of our institutions? Are our institutions inclusive, or are they exclusive, just serving narrow and even Right? We talk about different approaches. Okay, how do we respond to this? Do, do we go with hard, harsher laws? Do we go with social justice? <coughs> do we go with cutting a deal with the groups that you're dealing with, with organized crime, with the cartels, uh, with insurgent groups? We go through a whole range and talk about what are some of the benefits and some of the costs, but then how do you deal with this at the state level? On asymmetric attacks, we talk about terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, and cyber, and the idea that they're all on an asymmetric battlefield. All right, shared utilization of the population and relevant links with transnational organized crime. That's why I lump them together. But we deal with these in terms of a very different frame of reference than you get in the Middle East talking about insurgencies and this because it looks different. You're organizing around maybe class based issues and links to organized crime within the Andes as opposed to linking around um, you know, different religious frames different marks of politics within the Middle East. Cybersecurity, um, in the Americas, one of the most connected regions in the world and one of the least prepared to deal with the fallout. All right, weapons of mass destruction, you have kind of a model regional construct that came together, you know, back in the 60s and early 70s with the treaty of against weapons of mass destruction and yet the question is, can they control what happens with illicit actors getting a hold of something because they get the state capacity and so on? And, and again, institutions are important. We run a cyber simulation so that students can see what happens with if a state is attacked, how do you deal with cross sectors, deal with private sector actors, how do you deal with universities, how do you deal with actors that the state doesn't necessarily like to deal with? So, and on defense, we, we deal with the issues of in the Americas, the military is increasingly called, being called into policing roles, uh, which after the Cold War, people were saying never again, but when 
do it for the the streets, and you have a democratic framework, the population says, I don't want to be safe, send the military. So the military is caught in a very strange place. And, and kind of right-wing populist politics right now in the Americas is, is going in a very strange direction. Um, so securitization of public space, a deinstitutionalization effect. When the military takes care of these functions, the other institutions never show up. And then finally, civil military relation tensions because you lose credibility if you target the wrong people. Okay? So these are things that we're dealing with at multidimensional security. What I think the value is, and when we teach we don't get a doctrine mention this is how it's supposed to be, but as we talk about these things, we frame um, the importance of seeing the other. There, there's, a, there's an old Asian uh, parable about six blind men and a wise man that says, okay, what's in front of them? Each labels what they have in front of them. And so, you know, one says, hey, it's, it's a snake. Another says it's a wall. Another says it's a rope. Another says um, that it's a fan, depending on which part of the elephant they're touching. And one of the things I try to bring out for a lot of my student body, for I've been able to speak on these kind of issues a little bit before the, the ambassadors have touched the organization of the United States too, if we don't look at the big picture, we're going to come up with a perfect strategy to defeat a snake. Unfortunately, you're facing an elephant. So you have a great strategy to deal with the snake, but you're going to get stopped by an elephant. Um, and I think that's a major issue. The, the, this multinational security is great for analysis and it's a diagnostic, but when it gets to implementation, it's a challenge because there's not really the will of the states to give up, to give up sovereignty. People don't want to get rid of their structures. They don't want other institutions coming in. And you also have an issue on this uh, from the human rights groups, which is great. They're saying, what's, what's happening with militarization? Right? People are coming into the space, so we don't want more implementation because we don't trust how the government will handle this And so the question is, how do we prioritize threats and challenges? So I'm trying to get people look not just the regional, but at the sub-regional. What's happening not just with or with the Americans, you know, from Canada all the way down to Argentina, but what's happening in the Caribbean? What's happening in Central America? So if we look at these, what are the most important threats and challenges that are being faced there, and what are some holistic and more peace-building frame responses that we might give to All right? And so, jumping around, I apologize. So, in terms of smart security, a few things that we've looked at uh, from Ambassador Blackwell, he's Canadian, and he was the first secretary of multidimensional security, one of the first, with the Organization of the United States. Evidence-based, practical policy proposals, integration of best practices, multi-stakeholder, the idea of seeing the whole elephant, and then looking at you have to come back and engage. Um, and a lot of this comes back to strengthening inclusive institutions and thinking about really getting seriously the tensions that are implicit between national security, how states act, and human security, which we say we're all trying to help out the individuals and help out them marginalized, do states always care about it? And so are they down to these things? Um, so in the Americas, we're looking at, you know, what do we do with shared definitions, coordination, engagement of diverse sectors, institutional development, and trying to look at political will. Looking at something like NATO or even the EU, how do you get something that, that can work? Um, and as we, as we look at the Middle East, again, I'm speaking out of more ignorance than this time here. Um, but the idea of what, what are some shared issues that we have in the Middle East and that we have with what's happening in the Americas. Small states, a dominant US role, inequality, environmental issues, non-traditional <coughs> right? These are things that are shared. Um, the value of an integrated approach, trying to understand how we sit together, kind of what Sam was talking about, possible state and regional reforms to engage diverse sectors, inclusivity, um, institutional development, state capacity in many of these states. In the Middle East and in the Americas, lack inclusive institutions, and we need political work. So, so as, we, as we think about these issues, I, kind of what I put on the table in response to what Sam is talking about is, you know, we have crypto, we have other places that have tried to think about this. It's not always working. But there may be some ideas on the table of how do we think about security in a broad sense, um, and then with the way, how do you apply it in ways that might be kind of more 
already in one thought going on. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, so where do I fit in? I fit in uh, with uh, both uh, speakers in terms of their uh, biggest strengths, strengths and biggest weaknesses in their papers. And that is their personal experience. Uh, I'll get to that, but I'm coming from the greatest small country in the world, that is Slovenia, all the way to the White House. <laughs> uh, so, so that uh, makes me the greatest expert to come on their paper. uh, papers. Uh, so first of all, uh, Sam, uh, I will approach each paper in, in, in three dimensions, in terms of design, in terms of theory, in terms of practice. Um, so in terms of design, um, why the case study of the United Arab Emirates? Again, okay, I see you get a fantastic experience teaching that for sure, but, you know, I, I, why is this country so unique? Is there something special about it? And second, are you comparing programs or syllabi? And if one or the other, why not one or the other? And it would be great to compare both. Um, we can go deeper in terms of how to do that and so on. Uh, in terms of theory, the way your, your uh, paper was written, it was about geography. It wasn't about the size of the country. It was the geography problem. Uh, so if that is the case, then maybe you know, in the future when you down the line and you uh, evolve this paper into something more, maybe you know, it would be nice to compare different types of typology of different small states and their you know, foreign policy grant strategies. Uh, and third, in fact, uh, regarding practice, uh, why would the division of labor be so bad in terms of FBI versus CIA? Why, why would such a division, such a bureaucratic structure be, be deficient? Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm studying intelligence, so you know, part of my work is that I compare how different intelligence bureaucracies are structured. So you have division of labor in terms of the US, then you have you know, a complete hodgepodge of, of, of KGP, you know, former KGP uh, uh, in Russia, and then you have very interesting design of Israel, right, which has kind of you know, multiple uh, intelligence organizations. So is there a ideal type or let's say normative prescription for a small state in terms of bureaucratic structure, uh, how to conduct uh, security analysis and so on, or homeland security and national security. Uh, Mark, uh, great, great experience. I was fascinated about case studies, uh, your approaches in the classroom. I, I learned a lot. Got some ideas also as, uh, as a professor, what I can do with my students. Um, that being said, in terms of design, initially you write about different causal pathways for uh, increasing violence in, in Central and Southern America. Uh, you do not take a position on that. You do not have to, but I would like to see that. Right? And in particular, in terms of small states, is there one factor particularly that is unique for small states. What causes disruption in Belize or in Honduras? Are those the same things or are they caused you know, by completely, completely different things? Right? So that would be in terms of design. In terms of theory, uh, so again, one of my, work, one of my research uh, topic is cyber, uh, cyber security. Um, and you know, on your point, one, you position cyber bottom left, right? Uh, so you classify cyber. Yet, are those threats actually classifiable? Because cyber entails state-to-state -state national security threats, and it entails also cyber crime. You know, uh, in terms of uh, child pornography and so on, right? So when you classify it, aren't you already making a a bureaucratic and consequently also political determination how you will approach that threat, and consequently? takes you away from the multidimensionality of holistically speaking about the threat. Uh, I'm not disputing the multidimensionality, I'm, 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 I'm questioning whether the classification of certain threats is actually sensible, does it make sense? Because if they are multidimensional, can we classify them or they're, they're just multidimensional theory, right? And, and deriving from that is my uh, similar practice or policy oriented comment or, or question similar to, uh, to Sam, right? 
how is that a Max Weber ideal type uh, of, because you said states would, would be reluctant to shape their uh, agencies, institutions. Is there a Max Weber ideal type how you would approach uh, multidimensional threat? How would you restructure? Now you will become the dictator of a, of a Latin American country. How will you restructure uh, 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 the, the administration? And two, you know, on the flip side, is there a, a real life policy recommendation? How, let's say, the future new president of Venezuela would uh, approach the restructuring of Venezuelan bureaucracy to tackle multidimensional threats, right? He will be faced with a lot of challenges, but he will have the opportunity because he will be stuck in the new, right? Great opportunity to start a new, to build something new. Uh, what type of steps, small step, baby steps, can a state and a state uh, policymakers do in order to tackle uh, multidimensional threats? All right, uh, I, I've gone far enough, uh, long enough. Please uh, 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 provide your uh, questions and comments to the uh, panelists. Uh, would you like to respond to mine or should we go direct to? Uh, I can use it to say. Sure, sure. Okay. That's, uh, I, I think you asked Mark for the guidance. I mean, so, why do you why do why do you need to use the first of the practical issue, right? I thought a good case study might be better fit for this country than if I'd done a uh, an Nicaragua case study, really fit at this conference. Um, but you're right, and get the political science paper certainly well, need to make the argument that the UAE is somehow representative, not maybe in terms of wealth, but in terms of the challenges of a lot of states, smaller states in the region um, and outside of the region. Um, and, and I think there's a case to be made both with Threats, um, not all the capabilities, but some of the capabilities as well. But I, I think that's a fair point. And I think one of the reasons why I asked Mark to come is because I think we often don't look at these cross regional comparisons. But yes, the parents have a lot more money than the countries in the Americas. But I think that as I heard Mark listing off the challenges, we can see a lot of similarities. And some of the limitations, I think, are the same. Um, certainly, with comment about um, institutions, both inclusiveness and equality in the Americas are applicable to uh, at least many of the states in the Middle East as well. Um, yeah, what is a small state that's uh, uh, very directly developed in the paper? Um, but uh, now that you commented it, I'm going to thank you so you can't be on my reviewers. <laughs> Uh, so that's great. Um, but the other thing is the practical question. All right, what do we do about it? All right, I'm not a dictator. I can just be a so that'll be easier for me. But I think there are a lot of new ways to divide the labor. I'm going to give a strategic answer. But what's really problematic is the division of the of divide, of segmenting the people. I think one of the challenges the U.S. has had is as the labor is divided, so too is the thinking. So the thinking becomes not at the strategic level of the problems, about what is not the to do. And I started to see this actually replicated by some countries in the Middle East that they started developing, um, we're going to have these Western structures, but also for some reason importing Western stuff. Right? So I think there are a lot of models and practice that can work, and we can talk more about that in the q and but the real problem is the division So, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, so, you all didn't see the paper that I sent to him. It's actually part of a journal article that actually deals with more pedagogy. So, like, what are the actual things that I'm using in the classroom with these kind of senior military students? I didn't touch on that very much here. Anyone's interested in that issue? Um, I tried to focus on what might be relevant, kind of coming up here, kind of thematic. So I think your point though is, is, is what they did. When I talk about violence, which is the, the key issue in America that's driving this discussion, um, I said these are different causal pathways that are discussed, and I basically remain fairly agnostic. Um, I don't go into what I think is a driving factor. And I do that very in a very purposeful way in my teaching, because I try to get my students to not try to give me the answer that the professor is supposed to have. I try to get them to think through what does this mean in your shit? What are the drivers? If I were to ask somebody who you don't like, 
what would they say that what's going on, and trying to expose that there are all these different ways without giving them a right answer. And in some ways, I, I maintain that, because I think it depends. Um, part of my background, I think systems modeling uh, is my other job. Uh, and within that, I'm very interested in mechanisms of, at different times, different causal factors take on. And so I don't think that there is one. I think that there are unique ways in which these ingredients can come together. Uh, on cyber categorization, classification, driving, bureaucratic, structure, brilliant, brilliant critique. Uh, the question, why classify that? Because if I don't, it doesn't make any sense that no one pays attention. Once you make an analytical frame, people will pay attention, and you can try to get people the message so by saying asymmetric, by lumping cyber with WMD and terrorism, wait, what? How? Why? Well, because it's asymmetric. Because you don't know who did it. And who did it matters less than what does it mean to be conventional. Uh, which is also perhaps driving your right colleagues in some ways. But I don't want this to be just a defense issue or just a security issue. Cyber is an asymmetric battlefield where you don't know who's out there. And it doesn't matter if it's a defense or a security thing, because you need to figure out how you do a coordination mechanism. Um, from the analytic, what do you do in response? Again, I'm fairly agnostic. What are you going to do about it? We'll see. Ideal types, my preference. Um, I think it depends on the place. I mean, this is one where I think we have general models that can help us to think about in each place what are the, what are the, what are the factors that come in there, fairly general. But again, the configuration there. And so I can have an ideal type. If we're going to swim. But I would have to look at, okay, what, for change measure, what do I do with all these people that are part of the government right now? What do you do with them? And so I could go back to Bathysis, the Bathysm, the scheme, um, you know, in Iraq, and what played out was that. Or you could say, okay, how do you deal with what you have? And, and move toward this MDS multidimensional perspective basically says, recognize this is coming. And you need multi actors in a whole of government approach, and you also need to bring in sectors that are not part of the government because they're stakeholders in the game. And the more people you bring to the table and you engage and become owners in that process, the more problematic it is to get stuff done, but the more likely it is that you're not going to have a rebellion on your hands because everybody's part of it. Um, but again, getting to that place, I think, is incredible. And political is a challenge. We have 15 minutes. Put your questions and comments. Uh, when you pre uh, present, please state who you are. Please, the floor is yours. If you don't get questions, then I'm going to start drilling my eyes. I'm sorry, but I missed virtually all of this session. Um, so I'm not, I'll try not to ask you what you said before, but I'll ask this question. Uh, if you talk about these small, unstable government situations, which some people, particularly in the West, suggest need changes. What is the spark that can? What is the spark that can cause action to make the change? So, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, so, I, I think there's two pieces. Um, it can be bottom up, right? That there's whatever structures you have, uh, whether it's through an election, through popular protest, through the modulus and informal social pressure. So, it, it can come. A problem can be identified in that way, or in some cases, we can have a top-down identification of the problem. Um, that's harder. It has happened, but that's less likely, because that's us admitting that our institutions either aren't representative or don't work. Um, but I think, to me, that's something that both the Middle East, for the most part, and Latin America share. Institutional problems either not being representative, in many cases, or 
being ineffective in also many cases. And I think that's a place where the concept Mark shared about thinking multidimensionally is very helpful um, because from a security only, from a hard security perspective, uh, we tend to be much less critical about how our own institutional failings are contributing to the security problem. Um, solutions that are given from outside are always a challenge. Um, but the outside inside game is difficult there as well because if you say you're going to have social actors involved, there are linkages there as well. So if you're going to bring in NGOs, those NGOs have ties externally. Uh, religious communities have ties externally. So these are, it's, it's always going to be a mess. Um, but the top-down, bottom-up approaches, I think the other piece here is looking at are we trying to, I teach conflict resolution and conflict analysis and transformation, peace building stuff as well. Um, the idea of are we trying to regulate a conflict, basically just keep it from blowing up? Are you trying to do conflict resolution where you get the actors to come to the table and deal with each other? Or are you going for conflict transformation of trying to go for a structural change? My theory of change, what do I want to get at the end of this and what's the way I'm going to get there, I think determines that. And I think these approaches are just analytic constructs that then you can go different ways. You can take a very critical approach to it or you can take a very institutionalist approach. Um, I'm, I've, my research is around how, why young people join armed groups. So I'm very interested in how that plays out with gangs and insurgencies. And now I work with government people. So it's a weird mix. And I think I'm very open to the reasons why people want to blow it up. But the damage that can come from that, either from an external power or from a marginalized group, the damage that happens inside that society is huge. Um, costs are big. Follow up. Yeah, we didn't catch your name the first time around, or I didn't catch you. My name is Elliot Wolf, and I'm just a, a very interested observer. But I'd like to ask you whether the Egypt situation offers um, uh, lessons that uh, uh, I would consider, maybe I don't have to characterize the transition from the Muslim Brotherhood to the military, is, is how did that happen, and is it an example? Um, <clears throat> so th this is going to be maybe a, a sixty-second answer because uh, we could be here a, a long time. But I think what all three governments have in common, whether you have sympathies to all or none, so you know, back to Mubarak, uh, to the Brotherhood, to the CC government, is I don't think any of them really have answers for Egypt's social problems. Um, and I don't think any of them ended up having answers for the institutional problems that were visibly contributing to the social problems. So uh, that, that's what I see sort of uh, the continuity between all of them and why um, I think any government that you put in place in Egypt right, right now uh, would have problems because I think it'd be very difficult for any government to deal with the underlying economic and social problems. Um, we, can, we can chat afterwards about the, the longer answer if you're interested. Okay. Hi, I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins. Um, I am interested in radicalization and de-radicalization. I actually used to work uh, as a social worker, rehabilitation worker with youth at risk. Um, I've mostly worked with gang members. Um, uh, like you know, in in Toronto and then in New Zealand, and when I came here, I felt uh, the 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 private prison system in America just wasn't somewhere where I'd be able to be very effective. So I decided to shift to a different kind of youth at risk, and that's when I went into counter and uh, So I totally hear you. I'm also uh, trained in mediation and conflict resolution, so I think you must have seen me nodding at pretty much everything you said, and I took notes. And I really want to read your paper. Um, well. Um, Mr. Wolf, uh, I feel that, you know, society tends to go in a pendulum. You know, we tend to go from libertarianism to moderation to sort of uh, conservative and then back again. And that's what I think is happening in the USA as well. We went from wanting change going to Obama and then wanting change coming to Trump. And then eventually I feel society kind of stabilizes. Um, 
that would probably be a little bit that I would want to add there. Um, what I'm really interested in is this whole thing. I mean, in, in US, we have this really gigantic issue that we do not study grant strategy anymore. We do not teach grant strategy anymore. We do not practice grant strategy anymore. And yet, you know, Russia does that still, even despite its KGB steps going away, it does it. And, uh, you know, and this whole division between homeland games, home, home, the home away, away from home, it's almost like, you know, again, it's kind of like we're trying to compartmentalize through division of labor or division of thinking. And then again, uh, there is this whole multidimensional strategy where we see that, okay, even if we do try to have an integrative approach, which I feel would be a grand strategy, you know, trying to sort out the issue for to see how it all, how it affects Latin America in general, and then see how that might be useful for, you know, for how would that be implementable or sort of like how other, other regions in the world would be able to borrow from it. And that would, of course, of course, be another form of grant strategy, you know, but then it's great for analysis, bad for implementation. So is it possible to sort of bring that back into a discussion in terms of either, at, in, at least for academia, if not for policy? So I would want to hear what both of you think about that. Sure. So, so briefly, uh, and, and both of us have taught uh, U.S. officials. So, American government officials do get strategy at the defense college level. But there's another paper that's in my brain about why undergraduates should study grand strategy. So, I, I agree with you that outside of a very small group uh, in the government, we don't have enough of that. But if you do a uh, defense college program, if you're a lieutenant colonel or a civilian equivalent. Uh, you will get grand strategy. Um, so in the Americas, um, like I, I talked about this multidimensional security framework that is trying to be kind of a cooperative security framework within the region. Um, and it doesn't do that very well because the states really don't want to work together particularly well. Um, on certain issues they do and other things they don't. Uh, but there are states, uh, Peru, is really trying to take this seriously and say, okay, how are we gonna do this? So their new defense and security strategy is to looking at how do we do this and also how do we, not just, not just the military, not just the police, but how do other, like how do we build institutionality? Because we've messed this up before by just going in with guns um, and it didn't work well. So we want to do it differently this time and so now we wanna learn from it. Um, and I find it fascinating because some of the people that are writing that strategy are my former students, which I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's interesting. Um, and then I, today, before I came here, I, I was teaching, but we had a seminar from the new National Security Advisor for Colombia. And they're looking, okay, how do we do this? How do we bring together a whole of government approach plan, uh, post peace process, new government that doesn't really like the peace process, but how are we going to do this? Um, and kind of put that on the table. So I think states are trying to figure out how to do that. I actually think sometimes the U.S. is less strategic than it could be on that, but I think they do teach grand strategy in different places, but we often have a very limited scope of what that looks like, and I think it's a problem. Uh, my name is Hassan and Hassan, just an attendee here, and I'm interested in this dialogue. Uh, I'm just trying to understand, is there any link between what you told them in the United Arab Emirates and their decision by the intervention in Yemen? Is it some sort of uh, home game and the away game? So they send their troops to invade another country which overnumber them and oversize them because they are aware or, or afraid of the extremists inside? I'm just trying to understand their, uh, yani, is there a link between your teachings, I'm sorry, yani, what, what, their, what you told them? <laughs> One second. Um, just uh, so that you know, we have a slightly less than 10 minutes. I will let you to, or <laughs> Sam answer, and then I would take one last round of questions all together, like uh, do we have like three questions or so, and then let them uh, conclude with that, okay? Go ahead, Sam. Okay, and, and so obviously I, I don't want to speak for the government. This is just my personal observations. But I would say first, there's a Iran concept, right? You've heard the idea of the quote Shia Crescent, 
right? So there's a, a geostrategy element, right? The Emirati and the Saudi are very worried about, view, first they view the Houthis as a Shia proxy and they're worried about the Shia strategic control. But the second piece is a home game piece, right? Both the Emirates and the Saudis are worried about the rise of extremism inside their countries. And I think the view is that uh, Houthi in Yemen, it, it sort of, think about that the, the Bush administration, the ungoverned and hostile governed spaces being breeding grounds for extremism. I think in the strategic discussion you can see uh, something similar. I'll say this isn't, certainly isn't uh, my analysis, right? But uh, this is what I have heard and read. All right, any other questions and comments? Sure. My name is Rob Klein. Might there be uh, extending your analysis to include culture, or is that just too big of an enchilada to start biting into? Any other comments and questions? <laughs> No, 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 not because of the question, but because, as said before, of the final round. No? All right. So, so how many pages can I make people read? <laughs> um, no, I, I think that one of the problems of the American construction is that culture only seems to be brought up in a negative way when we want to talk about countering violent extremism. Um, and not typically, there are exceptions, right, but not typically in a holistic way. There, there, there are some American thinkers in government who do this well, um, but are, are often less represented in making the policy. So should culture be an element? I think culture should be in, in two pieces. First, uh, I think domestic security is also about understanding your own domestic circumstances, including your culture and whatever weaknesses you have. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, countries and interior ministries in particular aren't, aren't very good at being self-reflective about. You know, so that's the first piece. But then second, looking holistically, you know, we should be not sort of how is this culture weaponized in bad ways we don't like, but I think if we can, linking the culture to a lot of the dimensions that Mark uh, highlighted. I'll say the caveat is that really understanding another culture is extraordinarily hard and you also need to approach it with a tremendous amount of humility, uh, which is also not generally an American hallmark. So on, on the, um, to begin a discussion of culture, what do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual, right? What about two languages? One language? American. <laughs> okay. So, so within that framework, <laughs> within that framework, so I, I come to bear, like when I'm, when I'm teaching in a class, I'm very self-conscious of my both privilege and the other aspects that are privilege related, but it also undermines my authority uh, related with being, looking like I do, um, regarding my passport, um, and regarding my education, things like all of these things come to bear. And that is a barrier culturally. Um, and then it also gives access in other ways. And so I'm just very conscious of that in all kinds of interactions. Um, I think the thing about culture is culture is usually used as a weapon. And I think pushing culture back in on ourselves, I think is really important. So getting people to think critically about their own culture and how this plays out. So I talk about a culture of transgression through some authors that I assign. But then it gets back and they're like, it's really easy for people then point to point, oh yeah, well if people do that in my culture, that, but, I'm, but then I'm going, well how many of you did this recently? How many people went five miles an hour over the speed limit? Or, like the idea of looking back on ourselves of how we're embedded and even something of, because I'm dealing with a lot of military and police, I use Charles Tilley's fantastic article about the development of European states as organized crime. And it goes through, and it, so I flip it on its head of basically just the formation of the state is basically like a cartel, historically. And so what makes, what gives you legitimacy? And so getting at questions of legitimacy for people that take for granted that the state should be the, the authority 
and getting them to challenge and thinking, well, what does it mean if your state does not provide services and does not provide protection? Why would they think about you? Why wouldn't they go with the cartel who actually provides the things that you don't? Whether or not they agree with the ideology. You know, and so these are things of getting these actors. Now, is that a helpful thing to do within a, con within a, within a Senate or an academic class for undergraduates? I don't know. But when I'm with state officials, it is. So I think targeting who we're talking to, to get culture to go back on, the, on us and not as a weapon for othering, I think is a, is a big piece. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Lady.